Recently, Ubisoft dropped the world's first quadruple A game called Skull and Bones, and in true Ubisoft fashion, it kinda sucked. You will see that Skull and Bones is a fully fledged game, he said. It's a very big game, and we feel that people will really see how vast and complete that game is. It's a really full triple quadruple A game that will deliver in the long run. Guys, we promise that not only is this game real, but it's complete and we did finish it. People are really going to see that we did finish the game, and that's how good it is. It's not a little secret that big studios are dropping big stinky poop out of their butts for 60 or even $70 now. In the past decade, it seems there's been a trend of AAA games releasing in unplayable states. The game is broken, buggy, or even unplayable. Remember when they used to make games that worked? upon release? Remember when releasing a game meant that it was done? You'd think if a game is ready to be purchased by millions that it should be in working condition, right? Right guys? I'm gonna need to get out my exercise ball and green screen for this one. This isn't gonna work very well. AAA studios are so caught up in overworking their employees to launch a non-working game that everyone hates that they spent $70 on, riddled with predatory microtransactions after you've already purchased the full game. And they don't see how much that hurts their franchises in the long run. Because their current model is designed for maximum profit and not maximum enjoyment of consumers. Isn't that counterintuitive? 2K started putting ads in the game after you already bought it. Hello? Oh, this hurts my butt. <laughs> Shit. Cyberpunk released with game-breaking glitches because it wasn't done. But despite not being ready, delaying the release by another year would piss shareholders and investors off, so they decided that this was the best financial decision for them, regardless if the game was done. So they figured, hey, some profits is better than none, am I right, guys? Hey, who gives a fuck if this type of shit happens? Currently, the game apparently works great now. They've fixed many of the bugs and everything, but it's too little, too late, in my opinion. You get a reputation for doing that sort of thing. Diablo 4, I couldn't even play couch co-op without glitches that made the game completely unplayable. There was no option to just play offline locally for no reason, so we couldn't even enjoy our Chad Chad Eddie Burback warrior roleplay. I ended up uninstalling the game after several tries over several days and never played again, which I don't understand. We solved online multiplayer roleplay like 20 years ago. Greed is such a driving factor for why so many people just hate AAA gaming now. And it's hard to deny. Ubisoft's CEO spouted how you shouldn't expect to own the games that you buy. As in, gaming will be a service. If you don't own the game you buy, it can be taken away, modified, patched. You spent money on a product you don't own, which is just terrible and also explains why Diablo has no option to play offline. When servers go down, then what? When Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 released in 2015, the full game was actually just a modified demo disc that only had the first level on it and then authorization that allowed you to download the rest of the game to your console. They did this because they didn't have time to print the full game disc and when servers for the game went offline, buying the full game disc now does nothing. It's pathetic. And that's on top of how the game just didn't release in a playable state. John Riticello, the fourth former CEO of EA, notoriously greedy company, and who is now the current CEO of Unity, in 2011 proposed a model that would charge players real money to refill their ammo in online multiplayer shooters like Battlefield. This scumbag was partly responsible for expanding the popularity of microtransactions in games, and even proposed to charge gamers per bullet <laughs> fired in games. He said, when you are six hours into playing Battlefield and you run out of ammo, in your clip and we ask you for a dollar to reload, you're really not that price sensitive in that point in time. Since he's now the CEO of Unity, a popular game engine for indie devs, in 2023, John ripped me off cello, introduced a pricing system that would charge devs each time someone installs their game. That's on top of already paying thousands of dollars a year to use Unity. That's like if Adobe charged me every time I uploaded a video on top of already paying them 50 bucks a month. Not even they are that greedy. That's how greedy this guy is. There's more specifics to the pricing, but this absolutely kills projects, especially 
especially ones meant to be free. This dude is a villain to the industry, and I don't know how he became the CEO of another company to ruin. It's just really sad the direction that modern gaming is taking with not only these greedy CEOs, but going for massive games in terms of scale and file size. There's absolutely no reason that Modern Warfare needs to be over 200 gigabytes. Um, being buggy and unplayable, but also uninspired. In the era of every single thing needing to be a remake, this era of large companies prioritizing doing what's safe and pleasing shareholders leads to the same games with less and less content being released over and over again, at an expensive cost. Sure, a big game staying $60 for several decades technically means games have gotten cheaper over time due to inflation. $60 in 1996 has the same buying power as $120 today. That's like, twice the price. But really? Modern Warfare 2? Again? Really? Modern Warfare 3? Again? Do you know how difficult it is searching for things when they just didn't change the name of the new game? This drives me insane. They could have released Modern Warfare 2. 2. Or Modern Warfare 3. 2. The remake. Just give me something. Instead of innovation and gameplay and discovering new ways to optimize games through creativity and how they manipulated memory to fit on the tiny 64 megabyte cartridges of the N64, now we have juggernaut games that have no business being over 100 gigabytes, which I just find ridiculous. Like, did you even try optimizing anything? Why is Fortnite 90 gigabytes? Why? Why is 2K now consistently over 100 gigabytes? That's just a side note that's always pissed me off, but studios are clearly getting sloppy in exchange for time and money. Why wait a few more years to put out a beautiful, working, exceptional title like Zelda Breath of the Wild when you could just pump out a Pokemon game every year in worse and worse condition and make an even more exorbitant amount of cash? Vast open world with nothing interesting to look for or find, just to call it open world. And sure, many games do this well, but maybe focus on a great gameplay experience before just jumping into the open world trend. Because games that release in unplayable conditions mostly end up with a quickly dwindling player base. Yeah, we'll just go to B. We'll be there soon. No worries. Yep. Off the B flag. It's around this direction. Yep. Yeah, yep. This direction. Yep. I think we're going the right way. That couldn't play when there was hype around the game and never stuck with it or opened it again due to the sour taste it left in their mouths. Even if the developers fix some bugs and glitches post-release. Like taking a delicious pie out of the oven before it's done so it's just like hot soupy egg that might give you salmonella. There's a reason games like Red Dead 2 and GTA 5 have a dedicated fan base to this day playing online and solo. Even if you need to pick up each can of beans one hour at a time, Rockstar did something right, and it's releasing a game that's done. The bar is on the ground. But first, a short commercial break with today's video sponsor, Factor. Factor is a meal delivery service with meals that are ready in just two minutes in the microwave. When I'm too busy writing essays and sleeping, I forget that I have to feed myself, sometimes. Instead of having girl dinner, I can have Factor, which can also be girl dinner. There are over 30 recipes, so there's always something new to try, and you can customize your meals specific to your diet, whether it be vegan, vegetarian, keto, protein plus, or chef's choice, or other ones too. They also got you with breakfast, they have snacks, and my favorite are their smoothies. It's easy to get started, just head to factor75.com or click the link below in the description and enter the code gatekeep50 at checkout to get 50% off your first factor box. And this just in, you can get 20% off your next box. That's code gatekeep50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. Thanks to sponsor for factoring this video and now back to the video. But in the wake of AAA studios losing trust and consistency in the eyes of the consumers, while still pocketing so much money anyway, so who cares, uh, there are games that are trying something unique and fun and capture that same childlike wonder, like discovering you can chuck the baby penguin off the side of the map in Mario 64. And those are the rise of indie games.
PlayStation Plus is a service where you pay yearly to get access to a huge library of games. Some older classics and lots and lots of indie games. I started exploring the vast library of really cool indie games after deciding I didn't want to play Far Cry 3 for the fifth time. Nor did I want to experience the 10 Assassin's Creed games on here. So I started with just downloading whatever I thought looked cool, and it started with this really cool looking Chrono Trigger inspired JRPG Sea of Stars. Made me cry. Excellent game, and one best indie game of 2023. Then I discovered Tinykin, a game that outshined Pikmin 4 in every single way, in my opinion. The world is really fun to traverse, and the platforming gameplay is really well paced and extremely fun. It's not as sluggish as Pikmin 4. Moonlighter is a really cool game where you manage a shop by day and go battle dungeons for materials to sell by night. And of course those dungeons get harder and the materials get more expensive, and in the same vein I was introduced to an older game, Enter the Gungeon, a bullet hell roguelike that is extremely fun, replayable, and has a pretty solid couch co-op. And guess what? You can buy all four of these games at full price for one and a half AAA games. And indie games, especially on Steam, go on sale constantly. While writing this, almost all these games are on sale. And yet, Skyrim is still $60 on every platform for over a decade. <laughs> Back in my day, AAA games used to go on sale for $40 after a year. And it's not like these games are much shorter to justify the cheaper cost by any means. The hours at least I put into them are pretty similar to what I put into AAA titles as well. Of course, there are stinkers and masterpieces that live in both indie and AAA worlds, but, but people are certainly noticing a trend that these giant studios not putting out finished games does not cater well to the price point. And well, the fact that they're not indie studios. Hey, don't you have hundreds of employees working on this and it still doesn't meet the bare minimum expectations? The fact that many big game studios have garnered a terrible workplace reputation, not limited to overworking, unpaid overtime, and sexual harassment, that could be an entirely new video. I'm mainly going after the suits, single-handedly ruining the modern state of gaming by the power of pure greed. I'm aware there are more than passionate devs on these teams that want to see the hard work they've done be something they're proud of. I also want to clarify I'm not talking about games with a few bugs here and there, too. No one expects a game with zero bugs and releases absolutely perfect. The ones I'm talking about are the ones clearly unfinished and rushed, and which bugs make the game unenjoyable or entirely unplayable. There's a reason the guy that made Roller Coaster Tycoon by himself is regarded as a god among indie developers. He made this game in an archaic programming language even for the time it was released in 1999. Roller Coaster Tycoon has an impressive feat of almost not having any bugs in the game, and during a time where you needed much support of a team to create and release a game. During this time, making a game by yourself or even with a small team was not super accessible. AAA Studios dominated the landscape and said, here, this is what we got for you, and that's it. These are your only options here. And back then, the expectation was that it was done. Because after release, they couldn't rely on post-release patches and updates through the internet like they do today. When there were patches, they mostly used to physically ship out newer copies of the game. And this has affected things like speedrunning and tournament gameplay and games like Wii Sports and Melee, where different versions of the game matter. In Wii Sports, one version of Wii Baseball doesn't have this cutscene at the start of the game, and the other version does. In speedrunning, changes like this can be crucial to saving time. Yes, the PS2 and that generation of consoles had internet connectivity, but developers couldn't rely on everyone having decent internet and the physical adapter needed, and it wasn't a super reliable way to install updates to fix bugs. Unlike now, where a significant portion of gamers have internet because the landscape has shifted from purchasing physical copies of a game to downloading it on your computer. And if your computer can't handle handle the 90 gigabyte Fortnite file, then fuck you. You don't deserve to play. Yet another reason to cherish physical copies of media. I'm, I'm re-watching Inuyasha for the fifth time and the season six intro song is once again removed from Hulu and it upsets me dearly. If I had the physical copy of this, it could have been preserved. But now I just have to like play it side by side on YouTube uh, every time I watch an episode. Like, if Nintendo could have patched games in the Nintendo 64 era, they would have destroyed Mario 64 glitches. And it would have been even more difficult to get your hands on a version of the game where you could perform things like the backwards long jump. But then, everything changed when the internet attacked. I'm the face, not Pikachu. Hello? Yes! yes.
As the internet became more accessible, reliable, and better in every household, unless you have Spectrum, of course, game development also became more accessible and feasible for indie devs. You don't need the internet to code, obviously, but now you could work with a team easier online, share code, game assets, engines, tools, and the internet really allowed for community-driven indie development. In the early 2010s, we saw Minecraft and Terraria become increasingly popular. In 2015, we got Undertale and this song. In 2016, we saw also the pinnacle of indie gaming and the face of video game music playlists on YouTube, Stardew Valley, also famously made by a guy. It's undeniable how massive these indie games got and how massive of a community these games still have. And I feel like that was really the start of this change of tide for gaming as a whole. The way we consume games is so different than 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago. And while I'm disappointed at a lot of the changes, I'm really happy and excited to see the good changes. Like this game called Minami Lane was made by a couple in six months and it's awesome and I love it and I highly recommend this one for cozy gamers. I feel like I have access to so many different types of games than I ever did. At my fingertips with low risk and low commitment pricing. I'd say 2020 saw a huge shift in gaming. With large studios putting production on hold, that left a gap for some heater multiplayer indie titles to drop onto the scene like Among Us. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like the Among Us craze forever changed how and what games content creators stream and play and thus propel the popularity of. I'm probably biased because I am a content creator, but the ecosystem of indie gaming has changed so much even with the landscape of streaming and content creators. I know Minecraft isn't an indie game anymore, but think about how much it propelled in popularity during the Minecraft YouTuber era. And now a lot of these creators are being outed as sexual assaulters. Moving on, Phasmophobia saw this, Lethal Company, Party Animals, and now this new game, Content Warning, all focused on really fun multiplayer gameplay for a really affordable price, if not free. The price and eyeballs make these games that much more accessible to people of all ages. The goal? Get as many people to download this game as possible. Content Warning was free for the first 24 hours it was on Steam, and it saw 6 million downloads during this time. And after that, it's only $8. I don't want to harp on pricing too much because I don't think it's a giant factor in all this. You know, it does boil down to like corporate greed, but like it, it is a factor when you consider how indie devs don't necessarily have the same resources that big studios have in terms of marketing and reach. I mean, Content Warning is a game where you literally are a YouTuber and the goal is to film spooky stuff and go viral. This game was made for people to play on stream and make content around and it's so much fun on or offline. This is so painful. This way? I, I don't think they even know where it is. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, which way? Camera, where? This way? Speaking of the massive online community indie games have, we have creators like Game Maker's Toolkit, who first of all makes really cool informational videos about game design, and Donkey, who hosts community game jams, where people make and submit a game in just 48 hours based on the set theme. In 2023, Game Maker's Toolkit's game jam saw over 20,000 entries. Of course, these are not all full games, but all really cool ideas, which are truly impressive to see done and thought out so quickly and cleverly. Rollerdrome is a game that was first conceived at GMTK's first game jam, and in 2022 was released as a fully fledged award-winning 3D arcade shooter. This gets a cool out of 10 from me. By the way, don't forget to subscribe so we can hit a million subscribers. My mom told me to remind people throughout my video, so here I am. You're welcome, mom. Bouncing off of that, Steam and PlayStation Plus changed how we buy games. With the ongoing sales, releasing games in beta for basically free playtesting, games are just more accessible now than they ever used to be for everyone involved. And our library of games has ever expanded. And yet I'm still playing the same fucking game from 2001. And yes, I actively dislike Ubisoft's greed but am subscribed to PSN or PS Plus for the sole reason that PS Plus is not only much cheaper, but offers a much wider selection of games from a variety of publishers. Ubisoft's does not and is $18 a month. So many of us have played such a variety of games that may be at least my expectation when I've played so many great indie games that just work upon release versus big titles that are just broken or empty just feels extra disappointing. On top of remembering the ingenuity that went into a really cool game, gaming experience when everyone was just figuring this whole gaming thing out. Boo, 
wah, back in my day, gaming used to be good, now everything is shit. Wah, 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 you little baby, why you little baby, huh? That's not entirely true, and that's not what I'm trying to say. <laughs> gaming in general is like, objectively better now as a whole. Have you actually tried to go back and play some of those games on the original console? The cameras are jarring and make it borderline unplayable. And I know that's gonna be a controversial thing to say, but maybe I'm just used to the camera controls that we figured out for this century. And yes, I love these games from the bottom of my heart. I promise you that. My other friend is also playing Kingdom Hearts from the beginning and just wow. Uh-oh, uh-oh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh, but if you don't do anything, you just don't. It doesn't matter. I mean, this is quality gameplay right here. Just take your nostalgia goggles off for a moment. It's not as black and white as just like, oh, older games were better. I'm gonna get so much shit for saying that. <laughs> I'm not sorry to the Kingdom Hearts fans out there. That shit is raw. So like many things in this world, it's a spooky gray area with nuance. You can argue that gaming is both better and worse than before. And I really just wanted to kind of write like this love letter to all the cool indie games I've found in the past couple years and recognize the impact they've made on my life the internet landscape and how the good ones are so full of passion and fun and aim to do what they do really well. Instead of going for a vast, open world, I want to be everything type of game that ends up just being kind of mid. I also hope this encourages you to go check out some of the indie games that I recommended. Please, someone else play these games and if you have, please comment below. I really want to hear your experiences with them. Like I say when I'm procrastinating doing literally anything important by gaming, born to game, forced to work.